In 1973, Illinois Institute of Technology alumnus Marty Cooper made history by making a call on the world's first cellular telephone. Motorola, where Marty spent much of his career, had long been at the forefront of mobile, portable communications technology, thanks to the inspirational leadership of founder Paul Galvin and CEO Bob Galvin. For Marty, imagining our future was one part his natural disposition and one part culture, the culture of Illinois Tech, where he honed his skills, and Motorola, where he put them to work. Today, we're pleased to bring you a conversation between Marty and Michael P. Galvin, the chairman of Illinois Tech's Board of Trustees, the son of Bob Galvin, and the grandson of Paul Galvin. We hope you enjoy this opportunity to listen in as they discuss leadership, innovation, their shared experiences as Illinois Tech alumni, and the recent publication of Marty's book, Cutting the Cord. So Marty, I can't tell you how humbled I am to be able to be here to interview you about your incredible book, which tells like such an important story about innovation and strategy and leadership. I'm Mike Galvin, the chair of the board uh, of Illinois Tech, and Marty and I are both alumni. We also share as uh, members of the Motorola family, you know, I consider you, Mar Marty, you know, a part of my own extended family. And I'm just, you know, so humbled that, you know, we could be doing this together. Well, Mike, uh, uh, a lot of people plan their lives. I've never done that. <laughs> I fall into things and and one of the nicest things that ever happened to me was falling into Motorola because uh, uh, Motorola then uh, was treated just as you say, uh, uh, as a family. Uh, and uh, right from the beginning, uh, I resonated with the company. Uh, I met your grandfather. Uh, uh, I followed his precept and, and it's fact, and one of the things that we call uh, Marty's maxims, which are just a few of the principles that I lived by in my book, but one of them uh, is a quotation from your grandfather uh, that I really took seriously. And what he said was, do not fear failure, reach out. And let me tell you, I did take that seriously and I did have a lot of failures. Uh, and it's to the credit of that uh, extraordinary organization. Uh, your, both your grandfather and your father uh, were running it at, at the time. Uh, that they tolerated me for 29 years and, and together we did some some really great things and uh, and you mentioned my book you know when you live 92 years you can write a lot of books uh, so i tried to cover everything and you're right one of the themes of the book uh, is this the strategic issue cellular would not exist today as it is if it wasn't for the leadership that motorola provided strong comment but it's absolutely true. Uh, you know, Bob Galvin uh, bet the company. He spent $100 million of Motorola's uh, uh, profits over a period of 10 years uh, chasing or uh, fighting the biggest company in the world. And if that decision had not been made, the Bell System, uh, who were the uh, at that time the biggest company in the world, would have prevailed and we would have had card phones and not portable phones and the world would be very different, wouldn't it? It certainly would. So Marty, how does a guy like you who describes himself as one that feels like he's the least knowledgeable or least experienced fellow in the room or professional in the room go on to create a multi-trillion dollar industry? Well, first of all, uh, Michael, I have to tell you that I did not create a multi-billion dollar industry. I, I made a, a contribution to it. I hope it was uh, unique, but there were many, many people uh, that uh, helped create that industry. Uh, and uh, The uh, Gavin family certainly uh, at the, the lead of that charge, uh, but uh, I have always uh, been a, a dreamer. Uh, I've always uh, uh, lived in the future. In fact, that's uh, one of the comments that I've made that I know so much about the future because I spent so much time there. I, I have to tell you that that made me a lousy executive, uh, but uh, somehow or other, uh, the 
man, my managers always thought that I contributed someplace to other things than my executive ability. They tried to make a manager out of me for many years and uh, uh, didn't succeed. But when you get around uh, a bunch of brilliant people, uh, as I was fortunate to be with at, at Motorola, uh, you feel kind of dumb. And, and the skill that I had was to understand what these people were saying and to be creative enough to, to take uh, parts of the knowledge that they conveyed to me and put it together in, in a unique way. Being with other people is where you get the idea. Collaboration uh, is really the issue, not individual. It, 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 technology is so complicated nowadays that individuals don't do very much without lots of collaborations, lots of brilliant people working together. Uh, and by the way, that's one of the things that the, the cellular industry has done. It's made collaboration move to an absolutely new level. That's what we're doing right now. Yeah, no, that's great. And, you know, just along those lines, you, know, you talked about how important it was to be able to create and dream in a culture like Motorola that encouraged that you know, to reach out and don't fear mistakes, as you had mentioned, uh, was, you know, one of the shared maxims uh, at Motorola. Uh, but uh, talk to us a little bit about your own Illinois Tech. I mean, you and I are both Illinois Tech you know, alumni. We know that there's a distinctive, you know, ethos at this university that comes through so often in uh, innovative people and companies, and revo the revolutionary ideas that come out of Illinois Tech. Uh, and it's that collective power of difference to make a difference that, you know, we love about it so much. What was it about your experience at Illinois Tech that kind of helped prepare you to translate your dreams into reality in a culture that allowed you to do that? Well, when I grew up, uh, I knew I was going to go to Illinois Tech uh, even before I went into high school. Illinois Tech was the premier technological uh, university uh, in the uh, Midwest. Uh, and I was just, it was just a given that if I could afford to go there, I would. Uh, and in fact, I did go to uh, Illinois Tech uh, on my own nickel for at least one semester until the Navy uh, started to put me through. Uh, but the, this was a very practical university. They, they, they had courses that were the most advanced technology, uh, but they also uh, had some very practical courses hands-on, uh, and, and so you got the, the full mix of it, including, by the way, uh, the arts. Uh, one of my teachers was a guy named Samuel Ichi Hayakawa. I think he was gone by the time you went to IIT, uh, uh, but he was the guy that created the, the science of semantics. Uh, and, and so I felt I got every aspect of education covered uh, at IIT, uh, but still uh, in a very, practical way. There was no fancy campus like we have today. Uh, we went to school at Quonset Huts. Uh, one of the buildings that we went in was called Chapin Hall, uh, which was a, a remodeled tenement. And I have to tell you that there, there was not a lot of remodeling done. Uh, I have a, a distinct recollection of a stairway, a stone stairway going up to the first floor and that stairway was worn down. So this was a building in its last stages. And none of those things uh, were significant. What was significant uh, was they had a dedicated staff of uh, teachers uh, ranging from the most practical to the most uh, esoteric. Uh, and uh, once again, I, uh, I was just very fortunate to have the opportunity to go to IIT. Yeah, I mean, we talk about cultures. I mean, as a fellow alumni, I, you know, it sounds like your experience uh, earlier was uh, very similar to mine somewhat later and that, you know, you're just surrounded by, by peers and by um, faculty mentors uh, in an environment where it was okay to be different and to be a dreamer. And, and uh, we were young and, and uh, like you, you, know, you said in that observation, you thought you were probably the least knowledgeable and experienced fellow in the room. Well, you know, these these are the the peers and mentors that you know believed in us and and helped us give us that self confidence to go out into the world and 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 to show that maybe we had a little bit more experience or insider knowledge that we could you know help and impart. And so you know um, you know culture at Illinois Tech, culture at Motorola, in, in order to dream and invent, uh, this is so much uh, 
so important. Thanks for sharing those. But just to, you know, kind of uh, shift gears a little bit, I, I suppose, it, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't pause for a moment to touch on the present, you know, in the singular moment of time, you know, in the middle of a global pandemic at a time when many of us are literally separated from our loved ones and businesses and, and longing for connection, you know, the cell phone has given us a, you know, the gift of connection and community. Can you talk about that and share your thoughts about how the cell phone, the mobile phone is playing a role in connection with this global pandemic? Well, it's, it's interesting to, for me to look back and understand what the distinction, what, what did we really bring that was new? It certainly wasn't radio. What we did was identify as something that the Bell system never figured out, that there's a difference between a wired phone and a handheld personal phone. The wired phone connects one place to another place. The personal phone connects a person to another person. That may not sound very interesting to you, but, but that is fundamental. Today, when you call somebody's cell phone, you expect them to answer. And, 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 the, and this is a very new phenomenon. So, uh, 30 years ago, when you made a phone call, you were calling a place and you hoped that the person you want to talk to was there, uh, but he may or may not have been. Somebody else almost always answers. The fundamental there is that people are inherently mobile. You look at the freeway and you get the feeling like nobody's where they want to be. Everybody's going somewhere else. And, and to tell somebody that the only way you can communicate is by being tied by a piece of copper wire to your desk or to your kitchen table is ludicrous. So what, uh, what we did with cellular was this, set people free. What people did not understand is, you know, they start out with just a telephone and they didn't realize that at some point you would have a supercomputer in your pocket. They could do all kinds of stuff. Uh, and and th that you could start collaborating with people in all kinds of different ways. And we discover where we are today, where the biggest thing the cell phone has done uh, has been in the emerging countries. Because Facebook and Twitter uh, and, and uh, all the other social media, uh, I think are uh, precursors of what's gonna happen to collaboration in the future. But in places like Africa, India, Mexico, there are revolutionary things happening at the basic level. That, that, that healthcare is being revolutionized. That the idea of being able to move money from one place to another, to save money, where in Africa that was just unheard of. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, really important uh, observations on the both positive as well as the challenging, you know, side of it. I mean, you know, there are a few inventions that have you know transformed our lives as dramatically as the cell phone. But uh, what kind of advice and or inspiration can you give our Illinois Tech students, alumni, faculty, those others that are listening in to, you know, continue innovating in the context of the cell phone to solve you know the world's most vexing challenges, uh, such as the perhaps the digital divide. Never in history have there been so many opportunities to make the world better. And, and that is really what it's all about. Uh, I, I define technology as the application of science to create products and services that make people's lives better. There are, there are so many new technologies available. And let me tell you, I just to emphasize that, uh, a gadget is not a technology uh, if it doesn't have a human purpose. So uh, uh, otherwise, it's just a curiosity. Well, we have so much new technology uh, and so many human problems, the opportunities for people to take this technology and turn it into problem solution has never been so great. Uh, and, and that has been the focus of what Illinois Tech has been doing uh, in the past years is accelerating that process of getting students out into the real world. All of you listening, you're getting, you know, a bird's eye view into the mind of a futurist that's always looking at optimism and the, and the opportunities that come with adversity, like a pandemic, 
And uh, that's what's so exciting about, you know, having an alumni like Marty, you know, who's just walking the talk instead of just talking the talk. And uh, yeah, so Marty, I mean, uh, I'm encouraging everybody uh, to read your book, Cut the Cord, to listen to your amazing personal story in the context of all your innovation and entrepreneurship. And of course, talking about part two of the book, which is where you uh, share your prognostications in terms of what the cell phone has to offer uh, humanity going forward. But I wanted to focus at this point in time on Marty's maxims in terms of uh, how we can apply these in, in our own life too. So, you know, maxim number one uh, is one of my favorites because, you know, we all talk about, um, well, let's think out of the box, but not Marty, because your maxim number one says the best way to think out of the box is to go on to say, not to create the box in the first place. Can you elaborate on that, Marty, and, and let us know what you meant by that? Sure, Michael. You know, from, from our earliest days, uh, we are taught in boxes. We go to uh, elementary school and they have arithmetic and geography uh, and history. Uh, and we keep going through that all the way through college. Only when it got in the real world do we find out that's not the way the world works. The world is an integrated something. We, we actually start learning when we get out of school because now we're solving problems and you do not solve problems with one or another tool. You have to use all of the tools. And so my view is that the future of education, uh, of collaboration uh, is much more integrated. The, that our young students, they'll still be learning the basics but they'll learn them in the context of the real world. Uh, and that's gonna make a huge difference. It's gonna make people learn a lot faster. The whole concept of having a lecturer stand up in front of a group, which of course is what I'm doing right now, uh, and talk for an hour, that doesn't make any sense at all because that's not how people learn. People learn by having information given to them in context, uh, massage that information, think about it, uh, exercise it, uh, and then go on to the next one. So uh, th that's why I think that the education is going to be uh, much more online. It's one of the things that the pandemic uh, has done. Uh, and it's going to happen on a continuous basis, 24 hours a day, uh, wherever somebody is, uh, they'll be learning something. Uh, that, that to me is uh, revolutionized. It doesn't mean that school disappears. Uh, this, uh, the concept of what a teacher does is going to change dramatically. Teachers should, teachers should be there counseling students, uh, treating students as individuals because they are different from one another uh, and, and teaching them how to use the tools. But students should be accessing all of the information in the world, uh, uh, learning uh, solve, by solving problems. Oh, that's great. And that's reassuring for us to know at Illinois Tech, Marty, because uh, as you know, um, Illinois Tech for a quarter century has been doing what other universities are only starting to do now, uh, which is the interdisciplinary you know, program, IPRO, where we get students from all different disciplines working together you know, to solve uh, you know, vexing problems uh, using technology going into the future. So that's, that's good to know. And, um, you know, basically, you know, your philosophy is, is that technology is and should always be the application of science to create products and services that improve the lives of people. What, what does that mean to you in the context of your work and other companies that see technology different? Well, you push one of my hot buttons, Michael, because uh, the, the best example I could give of that is what's going on uh, with this thing we call 5G. Uh, we have been told by the uh, carriers who uh, incidentally uh, are the offspring of the Bell system. Uh, presumably the Bell system was split up so we'd have competition, uh, but sometimes the carriers forget that that uh, competition exists and they start acting like monopolies again. But uh, 5G has been presented to us uh, as the future of cellular. Uh, and yet, uh, the biggest advantages of 5G 
have nothing to do with people. It's called the Internet of Things. Well, it's, I believe that the, we haven't finished yet with the Internet of People. And I gave you some examples earlier about what's going on in the rest of the world where people's lives are improving. Uh, and that's where it's all at. The, the idea that uh, having super high speeds as an example, and low latency. Uh, Mike, when was the last time you had a latency problem? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, these are not people-oriented things. They are engineering gimmicks. There are people thinking in very narrow boxes instead of understanding uh, the big, big problem. I'm not against 5G. I think 5G is a very important step in, in you know, the advancement of cellular technology, uh, but the internet of people requires better coverage. You should be able to talk wherever you are. You, it's unimaginable that a major part of this country has no service at all. Uh, even places where the carriers say, well, we serve that area. When you go in and analyze it, you discover that the coverage is very spotty, that there are places where you can be including, by the way, my living room, uh, where you can't you get the cellular service. Coverage and cost are what people want, and not super high speeds, low latency, slicing, a whole bunch of other technical terms. So somehow or other, uh, this is a, an example of things getting out of control, people forgetting about the human uh, part of, of uh, what technology is. Yeah, I, I mean, and for, for those of you that are listening, I really uh, commend to you Marty's book because he speaks so uh, clearly and succinctly and persuasively on this topic of, you know, the importance of, uh, you know, understanding the customer and anticipating the customer's needs as opposed to uh, a team that uh, thinks that they know better and wants to dictate to the market what, what it needs. And um uh, this is, this is uh, so much about, you know, what your book illuminates, which is great. And I quote, customization is the inexorable direction of products and services. Uh, can you elaborate on that one? Oh, you bet. Well, the first comment that I make is that every person that has ever existed, that exists now, and that will exist for the indefinite future is different from every other person. None of us are the same. And yet, the manufacturers of our cellular products tell us the best way to communicate is to have this flat piece of plastic that you put against a round head and hold up in this awkward position. Uh, and that is what a telephone should be. Well, you know that's not right. And that is true of every other function of the cell phone. Everybody is different. How does the, uh, does uh, Samsung uh, and uh, Apple, how do they respond to that? They say, oh, we have a concept called the app. All you have to do to customize your phone is to select among 2 million apps and decide which are the ones that are right for you. Well, you know, it's, it's pretty much impossible. The, the reality is that somehow we have to figure out how to customize a phone that fits a person's personality, their habits, uh, and we're starting to do that already. Uh, Apple's got Siri, uh, the, uh, uh, Google has uh, Alexa. Uh, we, well, uh, sorry, that was Amazon that has uh, Alexa. Uh, what we are starting to do is put artificial intelligence into the phone. And I envision that the phone of the future will have an artificial intelligence that's your assistant. You may end up being your master, uh, if you read and get to the end of the book. Yeah, but uh, this artificial intelligence is analyzing your habits, understanding what you need, and taking over the jobs that you would prefer not to do. If, if it needs an application, it will go find one for you. And if it can't find one, it will create it for you. So you really should not be have to think about uh, how to make your life easier. That's what the purpose of this artificial intelligence. and and. As time goes on, and by the way, don't, this is not going to happen next week. It's not going to happen with the next introduction of the iPhone. Uh, this will take decades and sometimes generations. Uh, but at some point, these, what we ludicrously call a phone, 
hasn't been a phone for a long time, has it? You know, it, it's really going to be a, an adjunct. It'll be an extension of the person. It will take over the things that don't require the brain power that we have, that don't require an understanding of uh, emotion. Uh, and we can focus in on the creative parts of life and let this uh, artificial intelligence help us uh, get rid of all the routine matters. It could be a very different society. Wow. Well, there you go. Uh, if you ever wanted to get an insight into the mind of a, a globally recognized futurist forward thinker, uh, you just experienced it right there, which takes me on uh, Marty to Ma Marty's maxim number six. And uh, this is a little uh, wonky, but I think it's important for all of us to understand because it's the underlying uh, you know, technological component that makes all this possible. So the, the maxim reads, the radio frequency spectrum is public property in the United States. You know, remind us, what's the spectrum? Uh, why is it public property? And how finite is it? Well, uh, I've talked to a bunch of engineers, I hope. <laughs> and, and, and even you lawyers understand uh, about radio spectrum. But radio spectrum is, are the radio channels that we talk on, that we transfer information on, that we see videos. Uh, and if you think about the amount of spectrum that exists, uh, the, the myth is that there's a scarcity of spectrum. Our Congress has created an environment where they actually auction off the right of somebody to use a piece of the spectrum to provide a particular service, say a cellular operator, but it could be a radio station, a TV station, and they give some individual, some company, exclusive access to that piece of the radio spectrum. They do put a condition on it. The condition is you have to use that spectrum in the public convenience and interest. The way we have set this thing up, we charge so much money for this uh, leasing the spectrum that people get to think that they own that spectrum and that they can do whatever they want with it. Well, that's not exactly true. They do have an obligation. Uh, and and the, I'm back to the example of the carriers. It's more profitable to serve uh, people in the big city. When you have a dense population, uh, you can have a lot of cell sites, but each cell site has been very heavily used. They can make a lot of money. Well, they, uh, they, the rules are such, they better serve everybody in that city and everybody in their area. By the way, carriers, we need those carriers. We, all we want them to do is make slight adjustments. But the, uh, you asked the question about spectrum. Uh, the, the myth, I, as I mentioned before, is that there's an infinite amount, that there is a limited amount of radio spectrum. Spectrum is scarce. Uh, the, that is perpetuated by the Congress because they think they can raise a lot of money by having a scarce commodity. But it's kind of curious that we've never run out of spectrum. We now are, are putting 10 trillion times the data rate through the, all the spectrum of the world that we did when Marconi made the first radio transmissions. I mean, a trillion times increase in capacity. It's, I believe, uh, and uh, there was a, I uh, made an observation based upon fact that the um, capacity of our radio spectrum has doubled every 30 months for the past 120 years. Uh, it's, I believe that that, and by the way, what's made that happen is technology. The kind of technology that we uh, are uh, researching in our universities that we're doing in laboratories. Uh, and we know enough about the technology to know that uh, even what we know today will keep us going for another 50 years. 10 trillion times is just the beginning. So if there's a recognition of that, we ought to be able to solve all the human problems with the spectrum we have today. Uh, and this idea of giving somebody an exclusive hunk of radio spectrum to do what they want with is gonna fade away. We are gonna be using the spectrum efficiently. Uh, you will, when you do wanna do a transmission, 
whether it's a TV transmission, a cellular call, a, uh, a podcast, or a tweet, you will use just the minimum amount of spectrum over the minimum space for the minimum amount of time. When you do that, so just that last, last couple of sentences I said uh, is millions of times increase in capacity. So we have to learn how to use the spectrum more efficiently and we have to get the politicians out of the spectrum business. Well, it shouldn't be come as any surprise and Marty's too humble to mention it, but uh, there is a concept called uh, Cooper's Law. And you just heard uh, the fellow who popularized that, Marty Cooper, uh, articulate exactly what that means. That is the um, ability of technology to expand the capacity of the spectrum to serve all these um, in innovative you know, future uh, needs of, of the global society. So that, I guess, turns us to uh, maximum number seven. Marty's maximum number seven is ubiquitous and affordable wireless connectivity is essential, especially in education and healthcare. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I can uh, best give you a couple of examples. Uh, one, we, I think we've covered about, the, uh, about education. Uh, the fact that uh, access to the, uh, to, uh, the uh, internet and to collaboration with other people has become so important in the educational process that people that don't have that access are gonna end up being a lower class part of society. Uh, and I think that's unacceptable. But think about the fact that if people in villages in, in Mexico and in India uh, can get now get first class healthcare that they've never had before, is there any way of withholding that from them? Can you say that, that we have that ability to take care of people, uh, but we can't afford to do it? I think that's uh, unacceptable. We cannot have a two-class society because of the education. You can't have a class of society that is living longer and more healthily when the technology exists so that everybody can have access to the services and to the knowledge of the world. So. Uh, I don't know if I express that uh, uh, clearly uh, in the, uh, if I try to create a principle, uh, but that's what that principle means. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the cell phone is uh, certainly has the potential and is showing the potential to bridge that, in, 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 you know, or to narrow, shall we say, the widening gasm between the haves and the have nots, and uh, particularly as such pertains to education and their personal health care. Well, Marty, I mean, this has like been so great. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from, from the book is, uh, humanity is an essential ingredient to technology. The purpose of technology is to, is to improve the human experience. So yeah, as we wind down this, this interview, Marty, are there any other reflections from you know, the book or, or that quote you know, that you'd like to uh, impart to our audience? I want to point out, uh, Michael, that uh, when I joke about the fact that uh, what we call a phone is not really a phone anymore, it's a supercomputer with all kinds of uh, capabilities, uh, the U.S. is one of the few places in the world where they call it a cell phone. So many of the people listening, students come from countries where they're much smarter than we are about naming things. Yeah, but if you can, uh, come from uh, Germany or Japan, you'll call the the phone a, a handy, yeah, or in uh, in some parts of Europe, it's a mobile. So we are getting a little uh, smarter about that. The positive thing that is happening uh, is that most of the people in the world today have access to cell phone service. I don't think that's ever happened with any technology in the past. There are more toilets and there are more cell phones than toilets in the world. Uh, and there are many other comparisons you can make. Uh, and we are moving to the point, there are more cell phones in the world today uh, th than there are people. Uh, the two thirds of the population of the world actually have cell phones. Uh, I think that's increasing. The idea of calling it a cell phone uh, is gonna fade away. 
And this is gonna be a really important part of our lives. Uh, and its only function is to make us live better. We are gonna solve poverty and we are going to uh, have bring healthcare to everybody. And there is the potential, we never got into that. The cell phone uh, is going to be customized as we discussed before but it's gonna be different for everybody. And one of the things that the cell phone will do is actually analyze your body and look for baddies. What are, what's a baddie? A virus, a uh, bacterium, something that has gotten out of control of your immune system. And if you can do that accurately enough and to have a supercomputer, super, super computer uh, terrestrially located somewhere, it's analyzing your body all the time. You can zap any baddie that comes along, any virus, before it actually affects you. Think about what that means. No disease. So you're right, I'm optimistic. I think the world is better now than it ever has been. I think there is the potential to have a disease-free world with a much more educated society with absolutely no poverty. Uh, is the cell phone alone going to do that? Uh, of course not. But it's certainly going to be an important ingredient. Well, on that message of hope, Marty, uh, I just want to say, you know, thank you for making yourself available to our community to, you know, share with you your incredible story. For all of the, the those of you that have not read this book yet, Cutting the Cord, it's a very important story which has much to teach about uh, innovation, strategy, and leadership. And uh, while a lot of the, uh, you know, world-beating seminal work that Marty did was, you know, dates back to the 70s or 80s, it seems like ancient history now from a technological standpoint, but Marty just explained to us over this interview how it's still evolving and growing and has much opportunity at, ahead of it. I, I highly recommend that you read this book because the, the teachings and the maxims and the historical context is really important to know. Uh, for those of us that are trying to innovate and um, strategize and lead in the future. So, Marty, thanks ever so much for being with us. Michael, you're too kind. Thank you very much. Uh, you're, you're a superb interviewer. Thanks for listening. Cutting the Cord is available at the Illinois Tech Campus Bookstore, online, and wherever books are sold. If you'd like more information on getting involved with the Illinois Tech Alumni Association, please visit iit.edu slash alumni.